So, one of the most popular of the libertarian memes is taxation is theft. And probably the least popular of my videos has been where I argued against that. And uh, as a good example of what people think about when they think about taxation is theft, about that little uh, meme or that little thesis, uh, was brought to your attention recently, recently when somebody uh, uh, responded on a uh, uh, Facebook page. And they uh, laughed. Grow up was what they, what they said. Uh, and then they, then they came up with some arguments, so-called. What are those arguments? Well, uh, the gentleman said, not all taxation is theft, especially when that money pays for necessary services that are instrumental in supporting the infrastructure and services needed to maintain a large nation of over 300 million people. And um, it's a, I, I guess that's really persuasive to some people, but the funny thing is, the theft is not determined by what is done with the booty, but how the booty is obtained. Uh, just as you would not say that after you've been raping a little girl next door for uh, uh, six years, uh, you could argue that it's not rape because she really loves her little baby and the family has really come together since I raped her. That's just not, that's not an argument. Uh, theft is the illegal and immoral uh, expropriation of uh, wealth from somebody else. Uh, it involves uh, force or fraud. And uh, the question is, does taxation qualify? And taxation certainly qualifies as expropriation, and the fact that some putatively good things may be done with it has no bearing on whether it is theft or not. Cannot. It's just logically in another realm. So, first win on this little argument is that is for the uh, uh, thesis taxation is theft, because all the good things in the world you may do with something doesn't turn bad things into good. It still remains bad if it is bad. If it's done in a certain way, then it is theft. If you take the next, if you take the wealth of your neighbor next door, if you steal and go to home at night and take, take his coin collection and then give it to the poor, the poor may be in great shape, but you've still committed theft. Okay, he says it sounds appealing at first to think of keeping every cent you earn, but once you have to start individually paying for every basic service. Uh, for profit, private companies, you'll be begging for a return on how things are now. Can you imagine having to pay a toll for every privately owned road you drive on, or getting $10,000 bill from your privately owned local fire department? What about being charged $300 from your privately owned police department after they respond to a break-in at your house? Okay, this is uh, another really common uh, argument you see on the web these days. I've seen memes and videos devoted to it. We'll link to it below, I'm sure. Um, but it is the loopiest and silliest argument against uh, what we could call anarcho-capitalism ever made because it assumes that only government has good payment plans, which is just silly. Is it, uh, <laughs> I would say this really nicely. When my mother and then my father was taken in the local ambulance, which is a government operation, they were given bills for much higher than three hundred dollars. Uh, three hundred dollars. They were given bills of, ranging from seven hundred dollars to a thousand dollars for every visit of the ambulance, and that's not easy. But most people don't need. Uh, so the question is: Is there an easier way of doing it? They're getting tax money and they're charging for the ambulance, but not for, I guess, the fire or the police. So which is a better service? Well, in a free market, you'd figure out what the best payment plan would be. Uh, the ar the argument says assu basically assumes that those who provide policing would do so in the manner of an odd job plumber rather than Netflix or your cell phone service. This is just obscene. Uh, insurance and subscription are hallmark methods of paying in capitalism. Capitalists invented this stuff. <laughs> the idea that capitalists would charge for every nickel and dime you to death and offer no other way of paying is just it's just it's idiotic. Uh, it also assumes that the only method, uh, that your only choices in a free market are between, uh, you know, price per uh, price per unit of service delivered uh, services and government, as opposed to there could be voluntary organizations that do this. Uh, there are, for instance, uh, in in Southern Oregon, there's a town that has both a uh, public. And a volunteer, no, excuse me, a private fire department, and a volunteer fire department. 
They have different ways of paying for the services, and they have and they have different clientele. They compete against each other fine, and there's no great horrendous problems. So this is basically an argument from ignorance and making up a straw man that has no place in argument about this subject. Uh, well, what about the idea that you have to pay every time you want to go on a different road? Wouldn't that start to become cumbersome? Which is why that they probably wouldn't do that. You know, most private roads that exist don't have you pay for the services now because they want you there. So it's kind of like a sponsorship, yeah. like a television sponsorship. We have subscriptions, we have sponsorships, we have um, something like a menu pay plan that a cable company might offer right. you. And and then now, of course, you could have little 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 trackers on your car, and you can be uh, dinged for uh, for for you know, when you get when you get a special road that costs more. In fact, the, in Seattle, uh, I went over a bridge, and they just and I took the one lane, and they mailed me the uh, mailed me the bill in the mail. Uh, based on my license plate, so uh, this is all I did. I didn't have a little, didn't have a little uh, electronic device in my car. They just photographed my license plate, and a month later, I got a bill for three dollars and seventy-five cents. I wrote a check and I sent it to them. That what, wasn't what, difficult. What about the argument that that it's much more efficient for just a single, a single point of payment um, than having you know a hundred different payments that you have to make, um, and 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 uh, well, address that first. Um, I'm not sure there's any merit to that because when you don't know what the cost of a service and you start using the service uh, freely, how is how is that service maintained? How is you know, it? There's a, there's a whole it, it presents a whole bunch of problems that require economic solutions because all th all resources are finite, and when you have just one method of uh, of uh, paying for something like right now the main method in, in around here is uh, the fuel taxes right and fuel taxes work remarkably well because it goes into one pot um, and uh, and uh, and and that the state manages the roads however the county roads aren't maintained by state funds uh, that's a different that's a different kitty and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really interesting it's an interesting problem um, I don't really think that uh, it has much merit is it, it's just Basically, it's kind of like, I don't want to pay for anything. I don't want to think about the things. Therefore, I shouldn't have to. Well, but we, we buy, when we buy the candy bar as opposed to the lettuce head, we do make that economic decision. It's not opprobrious to us. I mean, we do make hundreds of economic decisions every time we go into town, right? Right. And it's really not that much much worse is that, should I take that bridge or should I take that toll road or should I go, you, know, you just have different options that you live by. I don't think it's that big of a deal. And also I believe that in a free society with you know many different, there'll be probably competing systems to make it easier for you. That's of course, what's assumed here is that the market is really bad at delivering uh, easy pricing, that easy services to make your life easier. Actually, the market's really good at that. That's what it excels at. Uh, that's you know that's why you have uh, competing online uh, payment services, and you'll have more in the future. Uh, it's just this this whole this well, whole argument about, makes about, no sense. What about all of those people who aren't prudent enough to to um, uh, set up their insurance plan for f possible fire or ambulance or, or fire department or police protection? Um, and so when when the time comes, are they just they're just shit out of luck, right? Well, not really. I mean, I don't have a Right now, I don't have a special contract with my the, with the local volunteer ambulance people. They'll send me a bill. So you'll be sent a bill. Then you'll think, oh my God, I have to pay this seven hundred dollar bill uh, for you know for, for just using an ambulance. So how awful this is. So maybe when they in a, in a free market, what you would probably have is you they'd probably ask for a subscription service. So they'd probably ask for twenty bucks a month or ten bucks a month, and you get a cheaper. Uh, it, it maybe they would have a price plan, right? So maybe for ten bucks a month, you would uh, you would get one uh, one ambulance ride for free in a year, and then your house for twenty bucks a month. Maybe you get two. I mean, it's just it's just depends on the pricing. It depends on how they how they work it out. But, uh, in, but inevitably, there's going to be a lot of people who just don't do it, especially young people who think you know I'm invincible, nothing's going to happen to me. Uh, won't look ahead. What what happens to those people who don't look ahead? Do we just take it for granted that a bunch of Imprudent people are going to fall by the wayside in this well, system. It's not so much fall by the wayside; is that they'll, they'll just be dinged for more money. I mean, if you don't have a subscription service that that saves you money over time, uh, or a sponsorship or anything like that, if 
and then they're charged and you get charged at a rate that you would rather have got charged, but you wanted to use the price, then you're liable for the charge. This is not that big of a deal. People do this all the time. People act imprudently all the time and they slowly learn from their mistakes. And of course, you say that young people don't do this. Of course, they don't they don't think about it. They often don't have health insurance because they have less risks than older people. This is, and they're also poorer than older people. So the, none of this is really very, very surprising. None of this is very, very insurmountable. It's all a big, this is, there's and, not and much. Presumably it, businesses who want to make money will be directing advertising campaigns at these imprudent people. No, sure. Uh, and, and seducing them right, just the way right. businesses do anyway. Um, and, um, so the, all of these problems aren't insurmountable. Is what not only not insurmountable is that capitalism does a good job with these, with these anyway. We don't really have problems. There there aren't these huge uh, uh, public uh, outcries about auto insurance in America. I mean, there are problems associated with auto insurance and auto pay, but there are not these huge outcries. Why? Because it's less regulated than healthcare insurance. Healthcare insurance is heavily regulated, and so it is. A, it's a complete mess. Uh, the, these arguments here, like almost all the memes I've seen against the whole, you might say, uh, non-coercive way of, of, of eliciting support for basic services, all these arguments are silly. There's nothing to them. There are better arguments. They're dealt with in the literature. These kind of arguments, the ones that we see daily on the net, are by people who aren't thinking very clearly and have never read the good literature. Who, who has written about these more difficult issues? Who's, who's addressed these, these objections and even the more sophisticated objections uh, than what we generally see in memes? Well, the memes are by people who, like I said, never read the literature. Or if they have, they've forgotten it immediately because it doesn't register in their brains. But, you know, I began this whole interest in this subject with Robert Nozick's Anarchy State Utopia. And his argument is all about the difficulties, some of the technical difficulties, with having private protection agencies in what we would call an anarchist, you know, taxation is prohibited society. And he argued that there should be a minimal state for a variety of complex reasons. And that and that is a libertarian argument. I mean, it's it started basically the modern philosophical libertarian movement, in a sense, begins in the sophisticated writings of Robert Nozick and his many critics. So if you've not read the critics, and about once per year, a major economist or philosopher comes out with a book that almost blows the lid off of half of these uh, half of the real objections to the very idea. Uh, Michael Humer has written an amazing book about uh, how uh, a free society without taxation could work. And there's uh, Peter Levin has also done this. Uh, there's a number of amazing writers. That well, there's David Friedman wrote. Uh, David Friedman wrote uh, uh, an important uh, book addressing any of these questions, didn't he? Uh, well, he did even before Nozick wrote his book. Uh, the Machinery of Freedom is a is a fascinating little book, and I really highly recommended it. I really highly recommend it to the anti-libertarians out there because if you want to make good arguments and not look like a fool, maybe you should acquaint yourself with the real thinkers in the movement, not with some guy you've just met, and then you come up with some half-assed idea of your own that's, that is nothing. There's nothing here. This is the silliest thing I've come across in a long time. And that video about uh, capitalism and socialism that uh, we saw about two weeks ago, a very professionally done video, is, is, is moronic. It makes the same points, is that you wouldn't want to be nickel and dimed by all this stuff. You couldn't pay for all this. It's just idiotic. This is not how the real world works or, not, or how markets work. And, uh, and it also assumes it's just very silly. So other people, did the Tannehill's, is A Market for Liberty a good good? One I've never read the Tannehill book. Okay. I mean, there's a lot of, the literature is vast. Molinari is an early one on how to finance these things, isn't he? Well, Gustave de Molinari was the Belgian economist in what we call the French Harmony or French Liberal School, who, uh, who basically came up with the idea of that we don't really need a state to provide basic instruments uh, of institutions of security. Uh, that it, in fact, in fact, he thought, and it, he gave some reason to believe that they would be supplied better on the market. The question after you read Molinari is not how do you fund these things, because you get the idea pretty easily that in the in a free market society we would fund these things pretty easily. The question is why do we never even attempt to do that most of this? And I think that that's the more important and interesting questions is why it never crosses people's minds to experiment with more rational and uh, more dynamic means of adapting to changing demands for security. 
And I think the reason is pretty clear is it's fear-based and it's people desiring to get the upper hand on other, pe other people. And they try to use uh, sub rosa means to live at the expense of others. So I think that uh, the real questions are not these little memes that attack the idea. The real questions and the interesting questions is why do people so, why do we so rarely seriously move toward these ideas? And I think the reasons are quite interesting. And uh, these memes uh, kind of half explain why, is that people look at their, for some reason, there's a whole class of people who are very fearful of having the foundations of the state system questioned. Whereas when you look at the, all the crimes committed by the states, I sort of wonder why would you never question them? Most of the great crimes and most of the great grinding inefficiency of life come from the government, come from the state, and these people are, you know, set never to ever question them and ridicule and resort to stupid arguments and ridicule to defend the basic idea. And I think that we should actually at least consider opening up society to more free market-based solutions. Uh, and uh, certainly, I actually don't believe taxation is theft. I think it's kind of a misleading... I, 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 believe, that, I believe it in the same way I believe that uh, uh, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. It's a rhetorical play. It's not literally true, and the differences are important. There is a reason taxation isn't theft, but well, why, that... why is it an important distinction to make? What 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 are you missing if you say taxation is theft? You're missing um, you're missing the acquiescence of the governed to the government, and you're not going to get anywhere if you don't understand why people like this resort to really bad arguments for defending a system that is grindingly inefficient and filled with rather stupid people doing rather cruel things, and they won't ever, and they just go, they're, 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 they're back, the hairs on their back bristle whenever it's, you know, an intellectual question is brought up against it. So why is that? And that is the same reason that it isn't quite theft, because people acquiesce and give the imprimatur of legality to a certain type of expropriation. It, well, it, and, so, and so it seems absurd on the face of it to these people who willingly participate to be told that taxation is theft when they know full well they don't consider it theft and they're part of the system. Right. And that's, but that's part of the deal here is that, uh, is that, um, here, I'm, I've lost my, I'm going to cut that out. Okay. Part of the deal here is that uh, they're trying to get, look at the last line of his argument. Uh, this is this is embarrassing. I think. Uh, Sorry to break it to you, this uh, this writer says, but taxes are necessary to pay for the services that you don't like to think about and could never afford to pay for on your own. He's assuming that by taxation, we actually get more than are taxed. What he's really assuming is that most people are getting something from a few people, or from those people. We're getting something for nothing. And what he's assuming is expropriation. He's assuming that the only way to get all we want is to is to impoverish uh, people who are better off than ourselves. Well, to be maybe to be a little more charitable to him, maybe he's thinking something like an economy of scale. That is, if we if we run it all through this centralized uh, service organization, uh, it will be cheaper than if we if we split it all up into a thousand different services. That's the engineering mindset. And engineers of a certain type of mind keep on making that kind of thing. That is actually not really real engineers. It's the fake engineers, the social engineers, the people who bring a sort of pre-scientific mindset and pretend that they're doing science. But what we, what we know about centralization is that it messes up almost all the chains of feedback. So that what we get is attenuated feedback and grinding inefficiencies again and wastes of money. Anybody who's worked in government knows that that uh, the the vast hordes of government workers waste most of their time. And the ones that don't waste most of their time are usually doing awful things. So, I mean, we know this is, I mean, if if you've worked in a local government or if you've, I mean, you, you just know that, that <laughs> much of it is bad. <laughs> well, my rule of thumb is if somebody is basing their great savings argument on the idea that uh, the problems will be solved through government efficiency, that seems so absurd on the face of it that uh, uh, it's difficult not to laugh. Well, that's why I was laughing. Yeah, no, it's exactly. It is. It's just a silly idea. Um, 
but you sort of understand where they're coming from. And, and, and it's just, we have to get people out of the idea of these knee-jerk habits. But a lot of it's really, I think, just basically very similar to the religious mindset. It's messianism. We want somebody to save us. That instrument over there, we've given it a lot of power. You know, we've given government a huge amount of power. And we says, government, save us. Save us from ourselves. Save us from our neighbors. Save us from those people over there. And that continual resting upon the Messiah, that Messiah, is the, the, is the religious foundation of modern statism. Well, isn't that, I mean, isn't it also tenable that people just are more comfortable with the status quo and they're afraid of change? Everybody, including you and I, are are uh, tenuous about large changes and we all should be we none of us should jump into things um without without i mean anybody who jumps into things without thinking about it is probably not a very prudent person that is digging your heels in a little bit is a good is a good thing uh, yeah but this is not a question of digging your heels a, into a little bit it's, it is certainly not the scientific mindset of of testing ideas uh it's 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 a it's a religious reactionary idea uh, and it's religious in the bad sense, not in the sense that, that all religion is bad, and just in the sense that it's dogmatic and, that, and it's just hidebound dogmatism. And you're right. I mean, we don't want to make big changes. And, but they're, they're... and there is sort of a willful blindness at the horrific aspects of the status quo that is parading all of the so-called triumphs of American socialism without recognizing how awful they are, how awful Social Security and Medicare and the police and the military have been. And I've, I've seen memes parading these as great American socialist success stories. So that does indicate a sort of willful blindness. Right, right. And, and, it's, and it's, part of this, is, of course, is about hierarchy, too. Uh, this, is, this is where I think that uh, it may not be possible to get the human animal to move to a more, a more rational system, uh, at least very easily, since we sort of accidentally got ourselves into it in the first place. Um, human beings love hierarchy. And we're, we're not really that much different from baboons. And uh, and the struggle for the alpha male and against the alpha male and then to accept the alpha male and then and just to accept the way things are, uh, and, Amer and and uh, in modern people we don't have uh, the struggle of hierarchy on a uh, daily basis. We just don't have that because what we have are these vast bureaucratic and, and political systems that are so large and transcend our normal experience that we then take our normal hierarchical leanings and our desire to accept, uh, you know, just the dominant male, which would be in the normal baboon society, uh, to accept the lead of others. Uh, and we just do it through the uh, traditional legal requirements and we just go move on with our lives. And of course, most of rational people uh, don't even do that. We just, we minimize our thought about government entirely and we just go about with our lives and we don't want things to get upset very much and that's entirely irrational. Uh, it's just that there's a real problem when you have systems like Social Security and Medicare that are so uh, unfair over the, t the time element and are so unstable and are so prone to uh, taking down the whole system. And you have now a, a, you have now federal governments and even local and state governments that are consistently uh, pushing the uh, envelope of stability in finances. They spend way too much. They promise over much, and then they let the future generation handle the bill. Pushing off of the uh, the burden of paying for the what you want, and using debt as an instrument for it, and also the manipulation of the money supply, uh, this basically turns the whole system into a kind of a crazed problem. And I, I, there are days when I have pity for the leaders of the United States because they don't, they, as soon as they realize what the real problems are, they begin to wonder if they could ever solve them. Right now, the, the federal government is, was it nearly $19 trillion in official debt? and somewhere between 70 and $200 trillion in promissory debt. And that's not payable. I mean, that amount of debt, with the promises we've made in Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security, is not payable under current terms. We don't have the wealth. So when it comes due, as more and more people retire and more and more people start using the medical systems that are designed you know, in the way they've been designed, uh, the system will collapse. Well, see, libertarians have been predicting the collapse of the system ever since I started paying attention to libertarian um, um, 
uh, writers. That is, they seem to be in the position of Chicken Little. They've they've been declaring collapse. They've been they've been uh, uh, declaring that if government does this or that, everything will go to hell. Where and government has done this and that over and over again, and things haven't collapsed. Okay. So. Well, that's true um, in a sense, uh, and uh, libertarians greatly underestimated the ability of the financial system and modern capitalism to bear the burdens of government spending, a government debt. They did misunderstand uh, that. The idea that this could go on infinitely and get increase, increase, increase is not plausible. In fact, many non-libertarians don't believe it tr to be true. And uh, as a personal aside, I should mention that in 1980, when I first got involved in this whole thing, I saw the doomsayers who were expecting, expecting hyperinflation the next week, and I realized immediately that wasn't going to happen because... It wasn't in the interest of the Federal Reserve to allow it. However, things have changed since then. The Federal Reserve put the brakes on the growth of the money supply in the late 70s, early 80s. We experienced a deep recession, and then we got out of it, climbed out of it, and had a nice period of prosperity, of, you know, really re remarkably well done. And they revised the Social Security uh, system at the time, you know, Reagan did, with Greenspan's recommendations, so that more and more money was taken from the lower, the lower class and middle classes. And that money went to, to, to basically pay for the deficit spending of the, of the, of the Clinton and, and Bush years. And uh, that's led us to an even worse situation. So we're doing as we're round two here, round three of these predictions. And I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, there are people like Robert Higgs who don't think that it will be catastrophic, that the, the, the people in charge will figure a way out of it. But what we have to remember is that the people are being screwed, and lots and lots of people are having less wealth than they otherwise would have because of these institutions that have been brought, enforced upon us. Had we lived in a free society with a better pension system, a more responsible one, one not geared as a Ponzi scheme, we would be multiple times richer and able to handle out of our own pockets most of our needs. That's not the case because people chose systems that are not reliable, that are geared to a kind of failure, endemic failure that we're experiencing now, and we're experiencing it now in many ways in, in the, in the uh, systematic underemployment of American workforce. Americans are working... There are fewer Americans working, and many people are feeling the stress of not earning as much money as they otherwise would have. And, you know, Donald Trump and others blame it because, you know, jobs have gone overseas. That doesn't bear out at all. That What's, what's causing it is the whole government morass, the whole mess that the modern state has put us in. And it's, it's, uh, it's really, really hurting lots and lots of people. But people blame others because they don't dare rock the boat that they think is going to take care of them. Well, do you think that it's a mistake, a strategic mistake on the part of libertarians to be constantly predicting disaster and cataclysm? Well, constantly. I mean, I was I used to make fun of libertarians who do this in the eighties. Uh, I was I I used to make fun of Ron Paul because he was saying what I thought was was uh, very silly things and very. Uh, about inflation and the necessity of hyperinflation given the Fed policies, blah, blah, blah. I think he misinterpreted, and many people misinterpreted what was going on. I don't think that's the case now. I've changed my mind. I now am with the old school. It's just I think that they underestimated what was uh, the the, uh, the nature of the system then. I don't think they're under underestimating it now. I think that Americans are in, you might say, the last gasp of prosperity and that we're about to hit a huge financial debacle. And it's not caused by a business cycle. This is not a business cycle theory I'm talking about here. This is the financial cycle caused by the welfare state and by overspending and by having what amounts to $200 trillion in debt. By welfare state, do you mean giving money to the poor? I mean welfare state as in everything the dirigista government does, the coal controlling state, the, the redistribution of state, the regulatory state, the warfare state, the whole modern Leviathan is at the, in, in America and in the West, in Western Europe is on the brink of uh, catastrophe, financial catastrophe. And uh, I don't know what we're going to do about it. And, I, and I, I kind of rue the day because we have people who think that the answer is socialism. And if, when you deal with people that 
with that little knowledge and wisdom, you have to sort of uh, shudder for the future. One last point. We skipped over one of uh, this fellow's uh, um, objections to um, uh, not, be, not, not favoring taxation. He says, oh, speaking of privately owned police departments, why would they even bother servicing poorer neighborhoods? Um, that's assuming that the only way to service, well, why would uh, grocers serve poor neighborhoods? Because there's money in it. Even if you have some, there's some money in it, the prices may be high and the service may not be as good, but they will service it. And in fact, why don't the poor neighbor, neighborhoods uh, g g join together and set up their own police forces? They did it in the past. Most police forces in, in rural communities in the past are basically just community organizations in the first place. They're not big government coming down from the rich cities to help the poor. It's people banding together and, and, and trying to sell, uh, solve their own problems. This argument is is, is doesn't doesn't have well, much. It would, be to... far, it would be far more likely that they wouldn't the police force wouldn't be terrorizing uh, the poor neighborhoods as they do now if the poor neighborhoods were the ones managing their police force. Well, exactly. I mean, one of the problems we have right now is 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 uh, the war on drugs, which is not something that is is. Uh, I mean, it's a, but it's, a, it's one of the many wars we have, and it's a contested war between various groups of people. Uh, and in fact, I think the only solution to this is liberty. Is that what 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 is the what should be defended and what should not be defended? Some people don't want to have uh, you know drug dealers on every street corner. Well, if if they weren't illegal, they'd set up shops on their own property. But wh why do they have uh, you know deals going down in parks and in street corners? Because why well, it's illegal to set up a legitimate store, set up a legitimate store, and then all of a sudden the drug dealing, you still get drugs, you get higher quality, and and, and you know what the, what's in them, but also it's not violent anymore. This is one of the this is this whole thing about the poor. The, the poor are much abused by current police departments, and he, this this guy is worried that why would anyone uh, police the poor? You know, it's just silly. It's it's. Though there is a problem, I mean, the poor people have a harder time coming up with the uh, basic, you know, with the wherewith to, to get stuff. And it's also the case that uh, it's in the interest of richer neighborhoods to uh, to uh, police their margins uh, to make things better off for them. And one of the problems we have now, it could be, is that we have too much of that in the form of uh, gentrifying police ideas. So we have a war on drugs that basically persecutes the, persecutes the poor persecutes them mainly. I and mean, the rich people take drugs too, but they really get busted for it. Any last thoughts on taxation as theft? Well, I, I don't like the, it's, this is kind of amusing, because I'm def, basically I defend uh, the idea of a taxless society as a good thing to strive for. Uh, but uh, it should be known, taxation is expropriation. And every tax is a harm to the people, okay? The only excuse for it, J.B. Say, the, the classical liberal economist, was the good get, get, can be done with the spending that it allows. Okay, That's the basic idea. The, the generalized public good. The generalized public good. The problem is the people try to turn that into uh, spending for everything. And when that happens, we, the problem is, you see, people look at taxes of government today as a, just an excuse to live at the expense of somebody else. That's not going to fly. Not everybody can live at the expense of everybody else. Somebody has to produce something. And it's better if most people are producing something. We want to minimize the number of people who are on the dole, so to speak, who are basically being subsidized. Ideally, a libertarian would look at the world and say, you know, the only people who really need to be subsidized are children. <laughs> and the parents, ideally, are the ones who should be subsidizing and should be required to subsidize. It isn't, it isn't the society at large that should pay for the children. It's parents who should pay for the children. And that's their obligation. That's the basic libertarian view. I like that idea. I think we need to go further towards it. Uh, taxation is theft. Doesn't turn me on as a slogan. But when I see the memes and the, the goofy and loopy arguments by the uh, progressives and other statists on the Internet arrayed against it, yeah, I'm looking at maybe I do like this phrase. I mean, when that much insanity is brought against that phrase, maybe it's time to support the phrase.